I would say in the end, as an art, as a professional artist, and I'll, I can't say it for other people, but I'll say it for myself. I'm best when my market is me. Uh, my name is John Wellington. I'm an artist. Uh, I live in New York City. I've been teaching for the last 30 years, painting, but mostly I paint, and that's that's who I am in a, in the short version. So I always, I, the, from the earliest moments, I was drawing or sketching simple little things, and I loved it. It's, it's where I found a certain sense of peace. I was an only child. It was a way that I could look outward and sort of capture what pleased me. So as a little kid, uh, when I was in France, I remember as a little kid drawing um, castles and archery and knights because I think I was exposed to it at two and three and four and maybe it was past lives. I, I have no idea, but it just felt so true to me, this, this sort of world, this older world. And as I got a little bit older, it, I, it would change if I was watching cartoons, if I was reading a comic book, I would copy what I saw or I would just start drawing. And my, my mother said something about me early on. She said she'd see me do the same drawing over and over again. I would start and I turn the sketchbook and I do the same drawing again and again. And she said she knew then I sort of had an artist's mind because she saw that I was searching for something. I was searching to get better. And it was my way of trying to embrace what I loved and also trying, there was a whole nother side of my art as a kid that was trying to understand what I was being exposed to. Art for me, and this started as a child, was looking outward to the world around me, looking inward to who I was. And I guess as I got older, I also realized it was looking forward to visions and maybe looking backward in time. And I've stayed true to that often. So I guess I always was an artist of some sort, and I always wanted, and by that I mean, I don't think in a pretentious sense, I just think I wanted to create, I wanted to recreate. So as an, one of the things that as an artist, I wish that I went to the Rhode Island School of Design for my undergraduate. And even when I was there, I wished that each semester we were taught a trade. Because often when you come out of art school, you need a trade. So after art school, I worked in a poster and frame shop. Uh, and I did that, I was actually working advertising before. I'd even represented J. Walter Thompson for the, their poster, The Empire Strikes Back. So as an 18 year old, I was my artwork was being shown to George Lucas and rejected by him. And they chose a, a poster so I was in the art world-ish. Throughout high school and college, I was working in graphic design firms and in advertising as an, as an illustrator and poster designer. But when I got out of art school, I wanted to be a fine artist. And I thought if I stay in graphic design or if I stay in advertising, I will become a graphic designer. I'll become an advertiser. And I wanted to be a fine artist. So I took a non, kind of a non-art job. I ran a poster and frame shop where I was able to sketch during the day when customers weren't in and able to read about art. After that, I became a bartender. I went to bartending school and became a bartender. And then I ended up with, through a friend uh, going to visit Marvel Comics, which was on 27th Street and Park Avenue at the time, I think, 26th, 27th, somewhere, at, in New York City. And I went up there to visit him. And it was exactly... If you liked comic books like Marvel Comics and superheroes as a little kid and you thought, oh my God, that would be the best place to work in the world. They must be having so much fun there because they may draw comics all the time and they must just be, must be the greatest place in the world to work. They must just, it, just to go there, you must look forward to it. You'd be right. It was so much fun. Nobody was grown up. Everybody, was a kid everybody was a geek and a nerd and looking standing in line for the you know the first terminator movie and the first uh, everybody was playing practical jokes on each other and it was the greatest environment we used to close the office well this is before i and i'm jumping ahead because this was me showing up and then going i think i want to hang out here so uh they snuck me into the admissions 
uh, submissions. And I was the assistant submission editor. And I wrote all the letters and looked at all the artwork and replied personally to every seven-year-old, every person in prison, and including some really later famous artists about how to improve. And yes, I was 25, but I knew enough to, if not to be as good as some of the submissions, at least to critique them. And I did that, and then I, a, a wonderful painter, great landscape painter, uh, named Christy Scheel, who paints in upstate New York. She was a colorist. Now, I didn't really know what a colorist was necessarily. I didn't really understand how comics were made until I actually started working there. I didn't realize, I thought it was just one person because when I was a teenager making comics, it was me doing everything. But it turns out you have someone who writes, you sometimes have someone who scripts, someone who has dialogue, you have someone who letters and does the balloons and does the outlines, you have someone who pencils, you have someone who inks, and then the last and lowliest person who makes up on the deadline is called a colorist. And that was me. And that was Christy. And I saw her doing it and she started teaching me. And then they would give me Xerox pages and I practice and get them critiqued by the different editors. And within a couple of months, I had my first job and I became a comic book colorist. And I loved it because it allowed me time, at least in the beginning, to paint. And I eventually became very sought after and did a lot of graphic novels. Uh, but at the time also I was a little snobby, maybe I still am, but I was like, oh, you know, but I'm a fine artist and I took some of my fine art paintings and I hung them up in my office at Marvel and, you know, and people liked the paintings and, you know, and there were other fine artists that became, that went into comics full time. So I wasn't like an outlier. There were people that went to the Art Students League and, but I sort of had like this, even though I loved comics uh, all my life, in a way I, I judged them. And I think my judgment and I think this is a lot of people that judge. It's not really about the judgment of what you're looking at. It's really about trying to protect your own ego. So you judge other people to sort of make yourself feel valid. And I think I was doing that. I didn't do it to my friends. I mean, I'm still friends with all these people. Uh, you know, we're talking decades and decades later. But I think in a way I was always like, I'm better than this because I'm a fine artist. And so my work, I was trying to distance myself from my love of comics to sort of protect this idea of whatever fine art is, which is absurd. And I colored and I worked. And then at some point I got a, a scholarship. I was reading the New York Post and there was this strange article on uh, this weird school, this outlier school that had you do dissections of cadavers and draw off casts. And it was talking about the old French Academy completely different than the Rhode Island School Design Education, which was a more, I'm say, contemporary art education. This was the opposite. This was ridiculous. It was completely looking back to this past. And it was exactly what my art needed. And I read that they were giving full scholarships. And because I went from, like, not getting a little bit of work when I first learned to, to color comics to all of a sudden having so much work that it was very hard for me to find time to paint, I thought, I'm gonna to go to the academy and derail my life for two years. And it's a full scholarship and I'll color comics in the evenings, which I did. And so I went all day from nine to five. I painted, I did my homework and I did comics, but I had to now take less than I was before. I took enough to keep living and paying my rent and my bills. And I, I went there for two years and uh, it was a fantastic change because I was around a number of people who wanted to learn underpainting, who wanted to understand egg tempera, who were interested in anatomy. And so I learned a lot. I kept com comic book coloring, but in my mind, I was sort of separating these two worlds and I wanted, I'm an artist, I don't want to be in comics anymore. And it's funny because the paintings I did after the New York Academy of Art were kind of monochromatic. They were gray, greenish, uh, very gray. It's not everyone, but there was a certain period. They're actually, I mean, these are nice paintings. These are my urban classical period. And there's some color here and there, but it was, for the most part, very, if I was going to use red, it was muted red. Everything was, felt very Berlin. Maybe I was listening to a lot of David Bowie also that could have done it. But I sort of wanted to separate my artistic side, my artistic fine art side from my artistic comic book side. When I worked in comics, I never, when I was in the midst of coloring comics, I never had a value judgment. I wanted to be the very best and do the very best work I could do for the 
for the inkers and the pencilers and the writer. I always wanted to make the very best product. And I was very proud of, of, of a lot of them. And I, and I think that's also why I had so much work was that everybody knew that I was never wanting to hack anything out. I wanted to do a great job. And you know, everybody else was doing a great job. I wanted to only add to that. But there was that other thing of fine artist versus commercial. And I had that, that, that pull. And as I've gotten older, and this is again many years ago, I actually now, if you were to look at my new paintings, when I say my new painting, paintings over the years, you'll find more. I've started going back to thinking about my comic book coloring to inform my oil painting. So now, not only do I see not a separation, I'm going to my comic book world, to the color choices I made as a colorist, and saying, I want to bring this into my art. And I guess that's what I mean about being expansive. So I'm not saying in my life I've never had barriers or walls or judgments. I mean, I'm not I'm not an enlightened Gandhi um, or Sid Arthur or something. I mean, I'm a human, right? You all have judgments, but and I have. But I try and learn from them, and I try and break them down, not to be necessarily just a better person, but because it helps me as an artist and to be a better person. And to this day, I'm still really good friends with a lot of the people in my comic book world and I see them and as I've been now and more in the fine art world all these decades and seeing that the fine art world is just as impure as every other world that I actually sometimes I not I actually sometimes my comic book friends are as gifted as artistic as creative as devotional as quote fine artists in fact they're you can't make judgments like that, you know, between the different arts. It's just like it's either people care and are devotional or they're not. I would say in the end, as an art, as a professional artist, and I can't say it for other people, but I'll say it for myself, I'm best when my market is me. The, the thing that I came to after all these years uh, is that my audience is me. So I want to do paintings that I can live with and that I can hang on the wall and look at every day and find something new in it and become no longer the artist. Like after I finish the painting, the painting dies for the artist and I want to be a client that just appreciates it, which is why my work has so much detail and so much layering of surfaces because I always forget. I remember all those struggles I have with the painting, all the ugly areas I will take full responsibility for. But those moments of magic, I always feel like someone else did. I don't feel like I did. There was like, because, and there's a reason for that. It's not just like um, self-deprecating. It's because those moments are like, as every athlete knows, as actors know, as anybody, as chefs know, it's called the zone. And when you get into the zone, things happen that you're not even conscious of. It's all your training, it's all your knowledge, it's all your skill, and you get into a meditative state. And in fact, these moments that I'm gonna say, paint themselves of course you're the one painting them but you're in another state and your brush is moving or, you know if I, i'll put in painting analogy but i this isn't everything that someone can feel devotion to and get into you know even washing dishes you know you get a pile of dishes and you start you go oh i gotta do dishes and then all of a sudden you're in the rhythm and you're doing dishes and you're and the next moment they're done and it's satisfying i mean i i'm mean, probably not for everybody but i'm satisfied by doing it a lot of times in my life, um, to find that zone, it's pushing through the bad period. There are little tricks I do as an artist. Um, one of them is setting up my palette. It's, it's uh, the rituals. So one of the tricks I do to get into the zone is look. I spend a lot of time when I come into my studio uh, just to look, see where I was so that you're not reading cold. And so I look and I sort of try and get a plan of action of what I'm going to do today. And that helps me. In other days, sometimes you just have bad paintings. So as an artist, as a professional artist, I came to the very non-professional decision to make paintings that if no one else ever wanted to buy, if everybody else hated my work and felt it shouldn't exist, I could still hang it on my walls and walk past it and enjoy it.